take care of yourself to better take care of others. Look, a fit, healthy, happy version of you is a better parent, a better partner, a better friend. You're just a better person. So if you want to be selfless, you got to be a little selfish. This one, uh, we had to communicate a lot, right, to parents? Mm -hmm. yeah. When they always didn't have time to, to work out? Yeah, you got to fill your cup up first. That's it. It, it reminds me of the... Um, you know when you're on an airplane and they tell you not to put the the mask on your hundred percent, right? Because that the, the the default is like save my child yeah, right but away. Then you that. pass out and everybody dies. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. And so I think that at you know first glance you hear that advice and it seems a little ridiculous, right? Like what? Don't think about my family or don't take care of them first. It's like no, that's not that's not it. You can't take care of them if you haven't taken care of yourself first. And so. I think that applies here tremendously. It's totally. the same thing. This is why when, when I eat ice cream, my kids always take the first bite. Just yeah. to make sure. <laughs> I call it the dad tag. It's safe. Yeah. It's yeah. safe it's, ice cream. Now, all joking aside, you know, all of us can think of this, right? We can all imagine a time when we felt not healthy, not rested, uh, or maybe we were sick. And think about just how you view things, how you react to things, how you are with people. I mean, we tend to be short, annoyed, more forgetful, less sharp, things seem more negative. We're not as productive, right? Mm. When you feel good, uh, it bleeds out into other people. When you feel good, you're more patient, you're more calm, you, you remember things, you're more thoughtful. You actually have the capability to help other people. Um, without feeling good and healthy or without your health, you're of, not only are you of no help to anybody else, but you actually can become a burden. You can actually do the exact opposite of what you're trying to do because now they have to take care of you in extreme uh, cases. I, you know, I remember years ago, years ago, I went through a really tough time because I had a, a close family member who was dealing with terminal illness. And I still went to the gym regularly, but it wasn't because I, oh, I don't want to miss a workout. I'm going to, my gains are going to be, I, I mean, I wasn't going to progress no matter what during this period of time, which lasted about a year and a half. Um, I knew I wasn't going to progress. I was too stressed. It was such a challenging time, but I went there because I, I remember I, I was like, this is, this is so stressful, so challenging. We're not getting good sleep. I need to do something for myself so that I have some energy and capability to be able to be there for this person because they're going to need me. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. I would go to the gym and it was, I mean, my workouts look nothing like they look like now. Like I'd go in there and do really light, kind of go through the motion just kind of be present for a bit because otherwise my mind was so occupied with figuring out what we're going to do to either help this person or, you know, later on how we're going to handle the the inevitable. Um, so my workouts were sometimes I'd just walk. Sometimes I'd show up and just walk um, and, and really not do anything strength training related. But it, it, it really was part of the key as to how I was able to maintain, you know, one of the most, I mean, in extreme cases, right, one of the more, the most stref stressful things that's ever been measured when you look at how stress affects the body is caring for a uh, loved, a loved one. Mm -hmm. So if you look at like parent, like people who take care of their parents, when their parents start to, you know, get to the end of their life, or if you're taking care of a sick child or partner, it's a massive stress. Um, and in order to handle that kind of stuff, you have to be, you have to try to figure out how to be your best in the context of what's going on. Now for regular life, you know, no, nothing extreme. I mean, if you want to be a good person, you know, parent or a good partner, mm -hmm. you're going to do a better job if you're, if you're, if you're fit and healthy or if you're more fit and healthy than if you didn't do those things. It's just a fact. So, and this is, I used to have to communicate this to parents, especially moms. Moms had a challenge yeah. with this because they're like, well, if I go work out, then that means the ultimate martyrs, right? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it makes a huge difference. Have you got, can you think of a, a, a scenario where you've actually seen that with yourself? Like you notice like, uh, like a clear, like I remember when that, like that light bulb, like really went off for me. I used to say it as a trainer yeah. all the time, but I never had that problem of being consistent until I got older and had a family, have kids. And then now you see that. Have you seen that in your own life or where it's like, oh, wow, I truly am a better version of myself when I do this? Like, can you remember when that, like that really that well, just light bulb the, went off? The biggest one was the one I shared um, because I, I, it was, it like saved me. It saved me from, it happened to everybody else around this person. You know, when you, because this was an extreme example, but you know, they, they were terminal. So you, you just watch them deteriorate. It's really hard to do to watch someone you care about and there's nothing you could do. And everybody around her, um, you know, all of the people that cared about her. I mean, it just, it, it affected, it affected me too. 
But I was the one that went to most of the appointments with her. I was the one that she was able to depend on and count on. And I, and a big role, a big reason for that was I was, I, I literally remember th thinking like, I got to take care of myself. I got to make sure I could stay healthy. I got to make sure I could stay, you know, fit. I got to stay sane because otherwise uh, we're all going to fall apart. That's the time that I can remember the most. Though. What about you, Justin? Um, you have some? Yeah. I mean, a lot of it is like the sleep deprivation stuff and just the kind of going through a lot of financial things and uh, all at once. And, and for me, it was, it was realizing that um, we had to figure out how to sort of defer things. Like I, I just naturally would take care of certain things that would alleviate stress and anxiety and um, kind of allow space for Courtney to, to be able to kind of, you know, have a moment, like work out or like go for a walk, like go <laughs> be in the world for a bit. And I, I, I had to do that in order to, um, you know, benefit the the household. It was the same on the, the other end of that, where she would like know that like certain amounts of sleep I literally needed because like my attitude and just everything would be affected, uh, you know, the next day. And so we've just, I guess, naturally sort of learned how to kind of ebb and flow with that, uh, sort of, um, division of, of labor and, and just, um, being able to kind of know, I think that's, the, that's the good part of having a partner too, is like, you, you can point that out. Cause you know, uh, Courtney, a lot of times will be the martyr and she'll just be the one that's like, I'm just going to take, and I could just see her, uh, you know, slowly sort of decline in terms of like energy and just like, um, overall like effectiveness and like snappiness. And so the, you know, vice versa. Uh, but, uh, I think, um, a lot of times you don't see it personally and that's the hard part is, yeah. is like, it takes somebody else to kind of notice, you know, some of those behaviors and, and, uh, to point them out. And then once we learned that, like, oh my God, I, I feel like, you know, I just need a moment. I had, I had to learn how to ask for help. I think that was the biggest part for me that was tough. Like I had to be like, I need, I need a, like space and I need to work on myself and then come back. And so it's been, it's been a lot of that, like back and forth to this point now where we have it pretty much down. Yeah. I noticed it uh, as a husband and a father. That's when it really like when both different scenarios. So before Max, the first time I really made the connection was, I think I've shared this a long time ago on the podcast was when I wasn't working out, I noticed that when I would come home, my, my support around the house, helping it keep clean and, and do things, chores, organize bills, whatever it was. Um, I just, I would be lethargic. I would get home from work and I'd want to plop down on the couch and turn the TV on or lay down for a little bit. I could really see a difference. And then when I I would train and I'd be consistent with my lifting, I'd come home and I'd be in this kind of active mood. So I would help around the house. I'd clean up. I'd do dishes. I would do whatever chores that we that Katrina needed around the house, like the honey-do list stuff. Like, I didn't feel like it was even that it was effortless to do those things. Whereas if I wasn't training, I like had to muster up the, the energy or the drive to want to do that stuff. It was really interesting to see what a contrast there was there. Then with Max, when Max came around, I noticed that same thing only with my effort to interact and play with him. If I wasn't training, I, I was falling off on something yeah. like that. And I come home, you know, from a long day at work, dad's you know tired. I just want to lay down. I don't really, like the effort I would put into the play with him would be different. I come back from a day of working out and training. It's like, I'm throwing him up in the air and we're chasing each other. Like it yeah. was a different level of interaction with him. And I could really see the difference in my own behavior. And it wasn't like either one of those things wasn't possible had I not lifted, but I didn't have the same drive and motivation to do it. It was effortless. If I was training, if I wasn't, I had to like be consciously yeah. thinking about like, to, like oh. focus on it. Yeah. Yes. Look, it's yeah. a, it's a fact. Uh, and the, the data is strongly supports be how health impacts your mental state, your physical energy and your physical state. Okay. So if you're a, a, the healthy version of you is always going to be more effective and better at doing almost anything than the unhealthy version of you. That's just a uh, just a fact. So, look, it's like having a horse that you need to do work for you, but you don't feed it. You don't let it sleep. Nobody would do that, right? I know, Nobody I feel, would have. I, a, I feel like it's so mm. obvious, and I don't think there would be anybody who would hear you say that. Like I never disagreed with that, or and I all, used to say it all the time. But I feel like until you like make that personal connection, 
you're, you know what I'm saying? Like nobody would argue that. No one would be like, oh, I disagree. An unhealthy version of you could yeah. be, could be a better this. Like, no, that you, everyone would agree with that. But I think the we're, I think we just don't think about it. I think when you're off, yeah. you're off and you don't, you know, you don't think about like it's how not that it, obvious all the time. Yeah, it's not. That's what I mean by like, it really hit home for me when I, when Katrina and I got together and I noticed it in my relationship partnership, I never really made the connection m myself. Like I wasn't, when I was a single bachelor living in my house, I wasn't making that connection when I was off the wagon. Did, did I let my house go more? Yeah. Like, it wasn't until I had something like a, almost like a mirror with having a partner and having a child it really made that connection. I, I think um, a part of it is that, because the truth is when you look at people who are, when they're under stress versus not under stress, they do engage in more uh, behaviors that are quote unquote self-care. Maybe not the best self-care, yeah. but people are more likely to smoke. They're more likely to drink. They're more likely to watch sitcoms or reality TV. They're more likely to use drugs or alcohol they're more likely to do all the things that will temporarily alleviate the stress. So people will do things trying to make themselves feel better. The problem is they do the wrong stuff. Yeah. And then because exercise and changing your diet is hard, mm -hmm. it takes work, right? It takes work to do those things because our you know, our impulses are to distract ourselves or reach for the tasty food or the, the, the junk food or whatever. Because it's more work, then that sneaky voice in our head that we listen to sometimes gives us the perfect excuse, mm -hmm. which is, no, oh, what do you mean work out? You gotta, you gotta go, you gotta go do that thing with your kids or you're going to take time away from your business. You're going to take time away from your spouse or your responsibilities to go work out. That's so selfish. Right. Why don't you go and, you know, become a martyr. And yet you'll reach for the donut, the candy, the cigarette, the alcohol, uh, you know, social media, whatever. So the truth is you are engaging in things to try to make yourself feel better because you're under a lot of stress, but you're not making the choice to choose the thing that really pays, pays you back. That really pays off. That's a tough thing to accept, but it's true. Again, look at the, look at the purchasing habits of people during the pandemic. I think the average American, how much weight they gained, but there was a, there was a faster gain in weight during the pandemic than we'd seen in previous years. There was a faster, more people smoked, more people drank alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all the things that we do to try to make ourselves feel better, the impulsive stuff exploded because it was a very stressful time. Um, so, you know, we do those things. We're just not really honest. And again, because it's hard, here's what happens. When something you, you know you should do, that you know if you sit down and logically and calmly have a discussion about or think about, you know, like I gotta do that. You don't want to though, because it's hard. It's really easy to let an excuse uh, prevent you. It's well, really especially easy. when you, oh yeah, that's why family mm -hmm. or job, right. or it's very easy to justify those things as more important. I mean, that's I think that's what happens is is a yeah you default to well, I mean, it's t time with my family, or yeah. you know, I need to work harder, stuff like that. I just think that that's what I mean by like. It seems obvious until you're in that scenario and until you really make that connection of like, and, and have the self-awareness to admit, like, you know, when I think about it, yep. I actually yeah. am, I'm a better father. I'm around more. I do more with my family when I'm actually doing that workout every day. You know what I'm saying? Like you start and the to, truth is, yeah. the truth is, uh, for vast majority of people, it just requires a little bit of planning because I'll have these conversations with people too. And I'll be like, well, what you could do is what time do your kids go to bed? You can go to bed like shortly after them and then wake up early and then do a little bit of exercise three days a week, you know, before everybody gets up. And then you get the like eye roll. Like, oh, yeah. but you know, I like to stay up late. That's when I get to watch my show. You know, That's why. Well, I just, I guess I remember too, to your earlier question, it's like in the middle of the day, I just want to take a nap. I yeah. just like, I got, I was so overwhelmed and just like, would just want to sleep. And it's like, I'm not playing with my kids outside. Yeah. They're on devices, like yeah. the behavior spirals, like it's all like this domino effect. When I, when I am working out, it's like, I'm already moving. I'm already doing things. The garage is open. You know, the kids are more likely to be outside. Then I go hang out with them and uh, throw the football around, whatever. But it's just like, it, it to me, that was like a glaringly obvious uh, solution. I also think, you know, to your point, Sal, about like, you know, it just takes a little bit of planning, right? For like the super busy. I also think that it's giving yourself permission too that it doesn't have to look like this hour bust your ass, sweat like crazy. Like if you're trying to 
implement this into your life and build some consistency and a routine. This idea that it you have to go from I don't do it to all of a sudden I need to be there three to four times a week for an hour at a time. No. It's just false. Yeah. And it's like almost anybody can find, you know, five to eight minutes to do two or three sets of some squats mm -hmm. or a deadlift pattern. You know, something that and if you can give yourself that permission to say that that's okay to like start there. Mm -hmm. And then you'll see that it'll start to build from that. I think that was a mistake too that I made with like clients was not understanding that, that I it had to be this like gym time. They had to go to the gym. Yeah. They had to carve out this hour. It had to be at least three to four times yeah. a week. And it was like, no, not really. If, you, if you're not doing anything in that direction, like, Hey, maybe just find that one that one day 15, that you 20 have. minutes goes a long way. Yeah, yeah. And, and and then build on that. And then it also helps because then they make that connection. Then then it's easier. It's like, wow, you know, today was the day I just did those four sets of squats and I noticed I got this done. I was this. I felt this way. My mood was out. It's like, ah, maybe I can maybe I can do another day like that. Maybe I can have another day where I just I squat again. And it's like then you start to make those connections to how you are a better version or you're better at everything else that you care about. And then it, it becomes easier and easier to plan and carve that time out, you know? hundred percent. It makes a huge difference. Huge. And it doesn't have to be much. It just got to be a little more than what you're doing now. And then if later on you want to get more, because li look, life, life definitely gets more challenging. Sometimes it's less challenging. You're not always going to work out the same. And sometimes it's going to be pure self-care. Other times you'll be able to go and chase a PR or, or progress or whatever. But the point is the point. The point is... And it, it's not the perfect health version of you because I think that's the, kind of what you're saying, Adam, is it's not, you're, I don't think you'll ever be perfect. It's just the healthier version of you is better than the less healthy version of you. And there's small things that you can do and prioritize that will put you in that direction. That's right. And yeah, sometimes you are limited, literally like real limited, not just kind of coming up with reasons and excuses, but you're really limited. But uh, that there's a lot of things we could do that are small That'll move the needle over. And that's all. And you want to walk around. Look, do you want to walk around with a, a good filter for which you see the world, receive the world, and respond to the world? Or do you want to walk around with a bad filter and be in a bad mood? I mean, I don't know about you guys, but you know, when I'm in a bad mood and I don't feel good, I am not even close to as good of a dad as I am. When I want I'm that in... auto-tune filter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you see <laughs> the she clip? Awesome? Uh, I, I was interviewed by uh, Stephanie. I can't think of her last name right now. She's in our forum. Um she interviewed me and asked about, she trains a lot of mothers and asked about time and like, you know, what do you do if you're so busy, this and kids. And my answer was right in line with what you're saying right now, which is, you know, we, we think this like, uh, macros and waiting, weight lifting, like that's like being healthy. It's like, dude, it's so much broader than that, that, okay, so what you missed your workout today to make a, a better choice than you normally would for dinner you know, or maybe go take a walk or there's still these, or maybe tonight you go, man, I didn't get my workout in. I didn't have a great ideal uh, meal planning day. Hey, how about I really hone in on my, my sleep tonight? I'm going to make yeah. sure I get to bed early. That's I'm right. going to do the, It's like, there's an opportunity in every day to move the needle in the right direction towards being a more healthier version of yourself, that it doesn't always have to be this, I won, I hit my macros, I, I lift weights. Yeah, that's great. And that's obviously going to move the needle the most, right? Many times. But it doesn't mean that if those, if life happens and you get busy and shit, it doesn't, doesn't work out. It's not the way all you or nothing. Yeah. It's not like you have to go like, oh, fucking right. Though. Now I'm also going to binge TV at night and I'm going to snack on candy bars later. night. it's like, okay, well, you missed the, the meal planning. You missed the workout. You still got an opportunity Look, to make your, your sleep better. If you need to go, if you need to travel 10 miles, uh, whether you move an inch a day or 10 feet a day or a centimeter a day, you're getting closer. That's the bottom line. Today's program giveaway is MAPS Aesthetic. In order to win that, you have to do this. Uh, leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comments section. We're also running a sale this month. Maps Bands is half off, and the Hard Gainer Bundle is half off. You can find either one by clicking on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Speaking of sleep, Adam, how is how has your sleep been since using 
eight sleep. Because yeah, I, I am. Uh, yeah, I heard you talking to Doug earlier, so I wanted to bring it up. On so the I'm, I'm going to sell some of these things. I swear to God, I'm like out hustling on the street with. The, I think they're so <laughs> the, back I, of your car. the trench. Coat, so listen, the sleep I, I'm okay. Sleep. So we just we actually Katrina and I uh, just got done negotiating their contract for next year. Right, they they're one of the companies, of course, that will be with us next year too. And I actually requested, rarely ever does this happen, where I requested from a partner that I want the guy who's responsible for the AI, because I have a ton of questions on how the fuck this works and how is this possible. Right. So after the first, I don't know, week or two, and I bet there's some sort of time frame that he can answer this uh, when we get him, it... it it, it starts to notice like all the times I manually, oh, that's too cold. Oh, that's, that's not cold enough. Oh, I want this time it to kick on this time. And then, and then this time I want to shut off. And like, you know, but it, so it measures and it tracks the AI tool is, is, is tracking all that. Yeah. And it's also tracking my heart rate, the time I fell asleep, how deep my sleep is, my score for my sleep afterwards. And it takes all that information and it now is manually adjusting itself. Yeah. So it's, I think I told you guys early on, like I was joking about like, oh, it gets so cold sometimes. I, you know, no, it's AI, dude. Yeah. It's so literally going to perfect it, itself. It no longer gets too cold. It's not too, it's perfect. Always. It's fucking wild. That's how, so weird. How it just kind of over the, t and it's been, I don't know. It is, I don't know how long. So, we've you know, it's it, weird. A couple it gets, months now. It gets better over time. Yes. It just That's keeps so getting, weird. it's just kept getting better and better and better. And now it's like. I haven't had to touch or mess with anything because it is like the perfect temperature. It's just the right cold to help me fall asleep. The sheet comes it, up and tickles your face a little oh, bit. Oh, <laughs> I'm so I'm so <laughs> impressed and blown away with it that I want to hear how exactly that's so crazy. Yeah, I want to yeah. know how exactly this is working and how it got to this. And or am I like just imagining this? No, no, no. That's what think... it says on the side. That's what the company does. That's why we. That's why we. Yeah, started. but it's like it almost seems too good to be true. It's like so good. Like, it, it, did it just hit just perfect for me? And I'm lucky. I mean, how's your experience, Doug? I know you're the only other one that's like really consistently using theirs, right? So when I first put on my bed, I put a topper over it. Oh, that's uh, right. And so I was manually doing it all the time because it wouldn't get cold enough because there was a layer. Then I took the topper off and I I had it down to like minus 10 <laughs> and believe froze me, your ass. it froze me, but <clears throat> now it's been probably three or four weeks and it has done exactly what yours has done. It's kind of, um, you know, figured out what I like and now I sleep like a baby. Wow. Yeah. It's crazy. Wow. It's really, it's really, really cool technology. I mean, I just, it was funny because when we were uh, working- Because monitoring all those things- they understand how to piece all that information together. Movement, heart rate, yes. like uh, you know, like body temperature. <laughs> so it's literally calculating all of that. That's why I want to ask him. I want to like what is yeah. so like does it all of a sudden notice that like uh oh when we when we, when Adam gets at two in the morning, when we let it rise up to say 80 degrees in the bed he's his heart rate goes up by 10 beats and you know it's restless weird? like is it like getting to that kind of a probably because hmm. you know what's really weird so i observe this in in my little kids because they're you know have a almost year old and an almost three-year-old right and we have a, a monitor on them and my three-year-old not so much anymore but my my year old she'll almost always wake up at particular times mm -hmm. and she just kind of wakes up you hear a little bit and then she goes back to sleep Okay. So it's like this pattern. And I think it's because what I've read is, is that she's, there's sleep cycles that have to get connected. But anyway, my point is, I'm pretty sure if you ever talk to uh, adults or clients, I used to, I had a lot of clients who would tell me, oh, it's so weird. I always wake up at whatever time, like mm -hmm. 3am or two. There's always a time, right? Yeah. I wonder if it picks that up and figures out like, oh, this is when Adam starts to come out of his sleep cycle. So then we, change these things, tweak whatever, and then we prevent That's why it from happening. I, this yeah. is why I requested someone because I, there's so many questions I have on like how, the, how they piece this together. It's got to be a cool story on how this, this technology was built. Yeah. Because I mean, I, you know, and to the point of the kid, like, I think I'm going to buy one for Max's bed. Max runs really, really hot. And so does my same. kid. With he gets that. up in the middle of the night. So I'm kind of curious of like, will it like figure out like for him to optimize his sleep? Cause I mean, as a parent, yeah. Not having your kid coming in the middle of the night almost every night would be a really cool. Yeah, <laughs> about it. yeah, that's definitely something I've been considering. I haven't done it yet, so that was like uh, one on the list. It would be great because it's like clockwork, like you said. Like you know, it's like twelve o'clock. You know, it used to be like two. 
12, it's like Everett's up and, you know, it's, That's the, Max it's right the now. same old thing. Almost every night, like same around one story. o'clock. He even, he's like. See, I think they're connecting sleep cycles. That's what I've read. Yeah. Well, because okay. I had people DM me like crazy about all these uh, options and things for like, if your kid keeps getting up and has terrors and all these things. And there was one was like a airway uh, that had some kind of a device that helps kind of open the airway a bit, like in terms of like breathing patterns and oh, things they, that they've noticed that helps. Um, but again, like there's just so many, and, and some people are like, oh, we just have them read, you know, until they fall asleep and then, you know, have like extend it for a while or wake them up like, you know, 90 minutes before they would normally have their like uh, time where they get up. And so, I mean, it's, I just got like an onslaught of options here mm. that I'm just like <laughs> kind of going through all these things, but we got the eight sleep. So I think that's next on the list. Yeah. Uh, I'm yeah. going to, I'm going to try it. I think it's going to be a, a worthwhile investment for, for him just because I noticed how he, he runs so hot. He runs hotter than me. Yeah. I can't believe like he'll come over on my yeah, side. Everyone sweats so, a puddle. He'll uh, kick the sheets off. And I'm yeah. like, damn dude. Yeah. yeah. It was like such a big fight for Katrina and I too. Cause <laughs> She wants to believe he's more like her, and I want to believe he's more like me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so she was always like putting him in long sleeve, long pants, and everything like that. And like, but like, oh, and I'm like, I'm pretty sure that he runs hot, like he's sweating. <laughs> yeah. Like, let him let him sleep naked. She's like, oh my god, no, he'll get too cold. It'll be too cold. And I'm like, I, dude, my three year old's like that. He sleeps with just his underwear. Yeah, it doesn't matter what the temperature is. Yeah, he, yeah. he does not like. He doesn't like a sheet on him. Nothing. Just cold. That's fact, Max. In fact, I told him, he's, I'm like, man, you're like a polar bear. Now I think he identifies with it. He <laughs> wants cold showers, cold bath, literally cold bath. Really? Uh, and he doesn't get in like, uh, he like gets in like, yay. And he starts playing. Interesting. <laughs> I'm like, what is going on here? Oh, wow. oh that's kind of yeah, crazy. Yeah, oh, that's funny. But I, now hot, at this man. point though, because he keeps saying, I'm a polar bear. I'm like, is he identifying the, with this now? It's becoming a thing, you know? <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Dude. Speaking of, speaking of sleep and all that stuff. So, I got to tell you guys what a shit show this morning was. So we we just were, we were obviously moved to a new place, organizing things. We organized the garage. I now have a place where the garage is far. It's not underneath any of the kids' rooms, so I could start working out in the morning at home again, which I used to love doing. And I, I'm, you know, Jessica, I'm like, honey, let's let's start, you know, let's work out again. She's like, all right, let's do this. So we starting. We're going to start working out together again. So the plan was we got to wake up early because I have to drive my daughter to school. So I was going to wake up at five a.m. And the night before she's like, oh yeah, you know, um, I'll have coffee so that, you know, while you use the bathroom, I can kind of wake up and they'll be ready to work out or whatever. Anyway, so I get up 5 a.m. She's not used to working up at 5 a.m. She, she normally wakes up a little later. So I get up and she's like, you're going to bring me coffee? And I'm like, what you, I thought you were coming downstairs. I, I, for whatever reason, I'm like, you're going to get it downstairs, not up here. Well, anyway, that made her pissed off. And she wakes up. <laughs> she's, she is, she has to wake up slow. Okay. Some I can, people I, are like I, this. I can relate yep. to this. Okay, you I guys can, are like I this. can relate to this. If she doesn't wake up slow, then another version of her comes out, okay? Like literally, yeah. I don't know what's happening the here. The gremlin. That's like me. if there's too much light in her eye, if I, if I, you know how sometimes you wake someone up like, hey, wake up, like you shake them? That would- Oh God. Yeah, I would be in a fight. You know that? You know <laughs> that would be a physical you have fight. To interrupt your story right now, but that, what you just said right now, do you know that was like, uh, I'll never forget that when I asked Katrina, like we were one night having one of those talks, we we're asking questions and, and inquiring like favorite traits. She, she lists like the top three trait of me is how I wake her up. She's all because she goes, it's a huge pet peeve to get like shaken awake like that. Yeah. And you're so gentle. And I am that way because that's how I, yeah. I get hella pissed if someone yeah. abruptly wakes me oh, up yeah. like that. Oh, I know. I learned that from you guys that time that we, that one of the first times we all slept in the same <laughs> yeah. house and I played uh, death played metal in the morning yeah. to wake you guys up. And we you guys chill. were, you guys were mad at me Which all is day. fine if I'm up, you yeah. know, but not I remember you guys get, were yeah. literally. That's how much I don't like you, like my days. I thought I was going to laugh. Ha ha. Yeah. Great prank. No, yeah. you guys were mad at me all day. I was like, oh shit. It never happened again. Over did well. Yeah, that's right. Well, I, I mean, because it's gen I mean, I gen yeah. I mean, that's a genuinely piss them off. I'm like, I don't yeah. want to do that. Yeah. So anyway, I so she comes down, is all mad, you know, yeah. and, and and I'm like, you know, she's getting her coffee or whatever, and she's on the couch, pissed off or whatever, because I just woke her up, and so now I'm trying to get everything ready, and and then I see her on the couch, and she's so upset. It's just like, just I'm so mad. So I go over to her, I'm like, you know, I'm trying to rub her shoulders, like, don't touch me. It's like there's nothing you can do at that point. Like she's <laughs> super mad. So I'm like, this is gonna be a great workout. It's gonna be awesome. <laughs> Yeah. So I go, so then I go to the bathroom and I, you know, then I have my pre-workout, you know, caffeine or whatever, and we're ready to go. Then we go into the garage and, you know, she's watching the monitor with the kids. So we have to make sure the noise, well, and then the little one wakes up. So now 
he's waking up. What's waking him up? I got to make sure this. Anyway, so this is the workout. This is what the workout's looking like, right? Meanwhile, my my teenage daughter uh, is having a just, just you know she just goes through moods. And she's just in one of those moods. She was like that last the night before. So she wakes up and there's one of those again this morning. So I'm dealing with that. So it was just fucking <laughs> shit show <laughs> all morning, dude. Meanwhile, you're going like, this is why I fucking work out the dude. studio in the morning. Oh, right? <laughs> dude, uh -huh. I, it's so crazy. So and so, I, so I'm I, we're trying to organize it, right? Because I want, I love work. I, my workout's very important for my mental health. You guys know that. I need to do it, do my thing. I feel good. I come to work. But I also want, I would love to be, because Jessica and I used to do this together where we work out and spend a little bit of time together eating breakfast. It's a great way to start the day. So I'm like trying to schedule it and plan it. But I'm like throwing a little, like, I'm like teasing her about it, you know? So I'm like, yeah. She's like, oh, this, after I left, she's like, oh, that was so great working out together. I'm like, yeah, it's all uphill from here. I said, <laughs> or, or, all downhill. I was like, you, uh, it's you all set the bar real low. She's like, yeah, because you were an asshole. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> well, like come on. <laughs> yeah, dude. I, I, you know what? I, 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 I wake up so different and I'm so, un it's like, because when I wake up, I'm still groggy. So I'm not like, uh, and I, you guys, it's hard for me to be super aware of what the other person needs, yeah. you know, yeah. when I'm generally, but in the morning too, the way I work up, wake up in the morning, you literally could come in and play the trumpet and I would get up yeah. and be like, all right, it's time to wake up. Whereas that would probably cause a heart attack mm. in most people. So. Yeah, no, that would piss me off. I would get really, yeah, irritated, dude. Irritated, yeah, irritated yeah, no, I just that. like, oh, I'm ready. I, that's one of the things I love. Katrina really yeah. like the, she's always been a champ like that. Cause she knows how I am with sleep that she, she's like, you know what? Like, yeah, I'd like him to get up right now and help me or do this, but I also know that if I ask him to do it, he'll do it, but then he's going to be a fucking bear mm -hmm. all day. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. She's like, yeah. I'd rather deal with the 30 minutes I got to get up right now and deal with the kid or do whatever I got to uh, do yeah. and let him have his Courtney sleep. stacks all the items later on in the <laughs> afternoon for me. And really? I do it all. Yeah, I, I wonder, so, in the morning. so, okay, so obviously I'm the weird one. So this must be like a switching of the well, CNS that if it's disrupted, it must cause in most normal people a stress response like that gets kicked off, right? That's hard to slow down. That I must mean, there's, be what there, it is. There's people that have theories around like you know, when you were born, if you were born at like the night, you tend to be like more of a night kid. If you're born in the morning, I don't know how much truth there is to that. Yeah. But, I don't know if there's uh, any genetic component to it either. My mom's the same way. Like she's like, my dad's always like dancing around like, oh, your mom's still asleep, you know? And, <laughs> yeah, you know, the solution will be crazy. Like she really will, you know? And like, I'm like that. So yeah. I don't know if I I got that from her or what there but has to be like a genetic component too i think i, I, think I so do too. think it's the switch right because you're going from parasympathetic to sympathetic and i think the abrupt shift for some people might make the sympathetic become like a well crazy and maybe just some response. people transition that's a genetically they transition very quickly right. other people it's a slower right. process right because i'm fine after about my half hour drive and one caffeine yeah. drink and like then i'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, my I'm first a peach. drink and i'm okay you know? wow yeah. So, but oh, no, this morning was hilarious. So, like, oh fuck, <laughs> <laughs> Doug, no. you're not a morning oh. person really either. <laughs> not really. Yeah, you're a night guy. I'm kind of in between though. Yeah. So, for example, if my phone goes off and it's time to get up, I just pop out of bed. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't have to necessarily, you know, just ramp myself up to getting out of bed yeah. in the morning. Uh, however. If you are to play a trumpet or shake me, yeah. you're going to see my worst side. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In the military, samurai sword. So I, I pop right up too, but I don't want to be talked to. Yeah, I don't want oh, all yeah. the lights on. Exactly. Like, like I'll, I'll get right up, but I it's got like, somewhere to go. I'm going. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. don't yeah. wake me up before I'm supposed to get up. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. that's what I don't like. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. no, no. Je for Jessica, not even light. Like don't like no light on too fast. Like we gotta we gotta like slowly oh, wow. ease into oh, wow. the world. Yeah. yeah. So bring her a coffee in bed now. So yeah. <laughs> just a little blast of citrus. Slowly but surely, uh, slowly but surely, you're being trained. Like you're a, almost. Yeah. There. Like almost I, I give it to her like this. Like you know, I have yeah. to hand her like this. You know, like please don't do sunrise. No, it's, it's I'm looking. I'm really looking forward to it because <laughs> what'll happen now is we'll be able to work out. We'll be able to make breakfast, sit with each other in the nice outside in the dark, eat a little bit, hang out, and then the little ones will wake up and I'll go to work. It'll be a nice way to start the day. Yeah. You know, so. you know uh, I, I told you guys I was going to implement this. I just, I, I, we did our first one. I was really actually excited and I'm, I'm glad I did it. And 
I think you mentioned that you might do the same thing too. I, I can't stress, do it now, start now. I, I, now I wish I would have even started even earlier because of how well it was received and how well it's going to work. Um, the whole uh, books for toys or things. So like Max asked for like a, he's all into Legos right now, right? So he wanted another Mario Lego thing. Mm. And, you know, in the past we would, okay, you know, we'd order it and he'd get it or whatever like that. And so it was like, no, we need to read, we had to read 10 books if we want to get Lego. And he was like, okay. you know, So he was cute though. Cause right after I said that, he like ran upstairs and brought 10 books down. You know, saying, like, let's, <laughs> let's read let's them now, dad. Let's do it. But I was like, okay, well when it comes, right, we'll wait till it comes. And then when it gets here, cause I still want him to connect that, you know, yeah, you got to wait. Yeah. And I want him to see that have to sit up there and wait until we get through the book. smart. Bro, and he was like so good about it. Like he mm-hmm. came in, he came in the mail. He was so excited, and I said, "Okay, don't open it until we get our books." So we went back upstairs, went, bought, went and got the books, sat down right next to me, and it was cute too about what the fifth, about the fifth book in because it's like sitting out so he could see it. You know, he, he got he got up from me reading and he went over and he was looking at it and talking all about it, and then and then he came back and he's like, "You you read." And then he wanted me to read while he goes, oh, I was like, no, 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 no. I said, together, <laughs> together we have to, okay. But he was really good about it. Sat through all 10 books that I read to him. And then when he was all done, he did that. And he's asked now again, I said, oh, that's, oh, that'll be seven books for us to do that. So starting to make that connection now. And yeah, because later he'll do it himself. Right. And I, and I, and the fact that he's already uh, receptive to it already That's before great. he can actually read himself. That's so good. I feel like it's going to be a really easy transition for when he actually can start reading. I go, Hey, yeah, mom and dad will get that, but you're going to have to knock out X amount of books or whatever to get it. I think it's going to be a really, I hope will be a really smooth transition because if he's already receiving that now and we're teaching him now that together we do that when he can on his own when I he's 16 how many books for Sweet. that car dad yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 2000 that's a degree the whole that's library a de- yeah yeah so yeah. that's a four-year degree yeah. so. <laughs> yeah, dude, that's, that's hilarious that's what that is. Yeah, dude. <laughs> i gotta tell you guys i i uh i um got a new peptide in the mail so <laughs> i laugh because all the peptides i try so um i you know i try these different peptides i want to see what the effects are so we can talk about them and the one that i have yet to try that it's always people talk about all the time it's known as tb500 or thymosin beta 4 is that like a fat loss one no is that that's not like it, the, no. the the t uh tb500 what were the what was that what was that popular supplement uh t T500 or wasn't that wasn't that it i don't know the the thermogenic for fat loss oh no it's oh. nothing like that no, no, no. You don't remember that that one? No, oh my no. god! It was, Cellucor had it had it too. I cannot think of the name of it right now. No. It was like T five. I thought exactly what it was. No, no, no. This is a this is a peptide. So, um, it's not a fat loss one. So it's it's thymosin beta four, I believe, is the actual name of it. And so check this out, right? So BPC one five seven, which I've been using, which I love. By the way, my favorite, my favorite. Peptide across the board is BPC now. Yeah, okay. I, would, I would agree with that. That's pretty great. I, I, I feel uh, just good on it, period. Now, it's a, it's for recovery. It speeds up healing of the soft tissues, like in tendons and ligaments. T500, wow, look Thank at that. You. Thank you, Doug, yeah. for oh. not making me look like an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> he, was like, he looked at me all like I was stupid. Excel Pharma. What a weird brand. Where'd you come up with that? I mean, that's that brand, but there, I've seen that T500 was a, a popular- it's definitely not that. Yeah, okay. Sorry. But anyway, so uh, B- and now the other effects I've gotten from BPC is I just feel clear, I feel sharp, I feel so the, so cuz it helps with systemic inflammation. And my gut is ridiculously good in comparison to how it normally is. Um and it's got to be that, right? Now, uh the TB500 or beta, excuse me, thymosin beta 4 works differently, but it's also for recovery and for healing. So the difference so so far from what I've learned is BPC helps with the soft tissue stuff, tendons, ligaments, joints. TB500 or thymosin beta works on actin, which is muscle. So it speeds up the healing of actin and the healing process in general. Combining the two Mm. is supposed to be like, this is what they call the Wolverine stack. Combine the two and you heal. Oh, really? Yes, super fast. (laughs) So I've been reading online people's reviews and stuff and they're talking about um, like how well it works. And like one guy was like, I was supposed to not be able to do activity for six weeks. Two weeks later, I feel like I'm back to normal. Um, I just started using it. I'll let you guys know what the deal is. They also sent me thymosin alpha, which is a different uh, peptide. Thymosin alpha, you only use once or twice a week. That is for immune system. And that's the one that they tried to ban 
mm-hmm. during the pandemic. That that. Now, the conspiracy theory is there were studies that showed that thymosin uh, alpha was an effective uh, treatment for uh, viruses, respiratory viruses. Mm. And so then they said, we're going to ban this. And so they thought, oh, is that why you're yeah. going to ban this? If because it works, that, yes, get rid of it. I know, type yeah. of deal. But the TB500, pretty crazy. So for people watching, listening, I, I'm not an expert on the peptides. I'm just learning from them, uh, from the experts that we work with at MP Hormones and trying them out a little bit. This one's going to be really interesting. I'll let you know. But from what I've read, people are like, I recover faster. Yeah. Uh, my People are saying- So like that, intense workouts yep. in general, like you would feel the effects of recovery there. Oh, right? I'll tell you. So uh, Jessica, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, whatever. Jessica- You're already in trouble for this episode fuck, anyway, so fucking so go, fuck. go all yeah. in, bro. She <laughs> she tweaked her, her back. So you ever get a, a spasm in your low back area? It's probably psoas. We're like, it's even hard to stand up and walk. Yep. You ever do that? Yep. We're like, oh, okay. This happened to her the other day because we've been moving so much. And she was effed. Like she couldn't get up. She couldn't sit down. I'm like, oh, this sucks. She couldn't pick up the baby. So I said, honey, do you mind, you want to try these, uh, you know, peptides, the BPC and the TB? And she said, all right, I'll try it. So I gave it to her two days, gone, gone. Woke hmm. up. She's like, this is weird. I don't feel it at all. Hmm. So I'm like, well, still treat it like you're injured because I don't want you to hurt yourself again. Well, well remember I told you that right. was the, when I first, because I think I took it first out of all of us yeah. way back when, when I got it. For your um, Achilles. Yeah. yeah. And it was like scary how fast it felt. Cause it was like, I, I know in my Makes head. You question it, Yeah. Right? Like I was still too timid to like really push it because like this feels too good yeah. to be already that recovered from what I just felt just say a few weeks before that. So, so crazy. No, it's I would say it's my as far as uh, peptides that I've tried that like I feel a difference that I would hundred percent. Which is what I think what all the research has said too is as far as like the most effective yeah. out of all the peptides. Right? Oh, here's what I was going to tell you guys. This is something just t- taking a left here. We're about to we potentially may see. One of the greatest battles in history. Okay. You got big pharma and you got big food. Both not the best mm-hmm. reputation. Mm-hmm. Right. Both kind of like battling they, each other. Yeah. Over what? Yeah. Okay. Cause since we're talking about peptides, <laughs> so the GLP one agonists like semaglutide. Oh, I saw uh, this about Ozempic and the, and then, uh, yes, I did. Oh, s- cause it's, <laughs> it's affecting their snacks, like uh, consumption. People are consuming <laughs> their less. So here's what the, the, here's what seems to be happening. And I say seems people to be because are eating enough Oreos. We know what the data sh- says on semaglutide, um, and GLP one agonists. These are all peptides. Okay. The data shows that people will lose about 20, 15 to 20% of their body weight consistently. Now, if you don't lift weights and you don't try to eat high protein diet, you're going to lose muscle as well as body fat. All Basically, all that's happening if you just take it and you don't watch other things is you eat less. That's it. Okay. But you may, you're not going to, if you don't eat more protein, lift weights, your body will try to adapt by paring muscle down. We know this. We've talked about this. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you combine it with high protein, lift weights, it could be, especially if this is a challenge for you. Which, by be, the way, this is right in line in the same exact uh, the physiological things that's going on when people do lots of cardio, cut their calories super high or super yeah, low. Yeah. And why we tell them that's such a bad strategy. Your body because, just adapts to it. Tries yes, to by slowing it yes. down. Right. So, so the big snack food companies are meeting, trying to figure out what they're going to do about this. They actually- Do you think they have anything to do with what's going on then, right? With like the I'm whole- I just going to say, mm-hmm. you are talking about two of the most powerful, big pharma, more powerful, but big food yeah. is very powerful, has their hands in the government and has had their hands in the government for a long time. Same thing with pharma. And so the propaganda- War is about to begin. That's what we're going to see. I mean, we already see it right now. That's I said. The stomach paralysis stuff they're putting out there, like, and it's like, was it one percent? Less than one. Less than one percent. And then, so what? What's what else has been taken off the shelves for way more than that? Oh, oh, nothing. There's things that are way worse that are that are sticking around. Yeah, they're still on the shelf. It's it's. Anyways, yeah, I I look at that right away, and I'm like, hmm. Interesting yep. that uh, yeah they also have an incentive because of uh, consumption. Of yeah, it's so so they're yeah so that's the propaganda machine, right? Like uh, uh, who knows? Because now you have these snack companies that for the first time ever they've never felt threatened by any pharmaceutical in terms of weight loss or fat loss. Never, they've never come out and actually had a meeting. So I read this <laughs> article. I'll bring it up where they're they're literally like uh, we we need to figure this out. Yeah. Snack food investors are concerned about the rise of semaglutide. Wow. That's lit- so Wall Street so Journal short, reported short this. Nabisco. Right. Listen, so yeah. Wall Street Journal reports investors behind companies including 
Campbell Soups, Conagra Brands. They make Slim Jim, you know, Orville Redenbacher. They're asking tough questions of executives amid the rise of semaglutide. So they're literally like, uh, hey, uh, what do we do? Like, yeah. what are we going to do about this? Because people are eating less. And because they're less impulsive, the foods that are going to get hurt the most are these impulsive foods that we reach for, like snack foods. That's that's what they that's what they feel at least, right? It's interesting. So it's going to be interesting to see the articles that are going to come out to try to like battle each other because you're talking about two uh, very ingrained yeah. behemoths, you know. But a calorie is to- just a calorie. So yeah, right. Why are we <laughs> worried about this? I don't know. <laughs> What are they going to do? I don't know. They're going to sneak like hunger peptides in their snacks? <laughs> uh, hey, speaking of what are they going to do? So I saw this. Uh, Put them on the next Titanic. Can you know that in California, the like squatter laws and stuff are so fucking crazy. I think everybody in here has had like a family or a friend or somebody that's been oh, yeah. screwed by some of the stuff. I was reading this article yesterday about- I saw this. The Brentwood. Did you see this? Yeah. This person, okay, Brentwood is an expensive area down in LA. Been, this person's been in the short-term rental for 500 days not paying. And they're demanding they from the owner $100,000 for them to leave. <laughs> They've already been staying there for 500 Just days. holding it hostage. Yes. Wow. And, they're, and because of the way the laws are structured in California, they way can't do it. What the fuck? I know. Can you believe that? Yeah. Like how ridiculous! You know is what it? I would do? What yeah. would you? I, actually, let me ask you guys: this. If you had a property, work in the system. I don't even want someone, to say what I would someone, do. Well, hold on. No, okay. Well, tell me what you can say, right? Yeah. If somebody moved in your place, I would get them out. Let me tell oh, you, I would. Find oh, bro! <laughs> I, so I already know. I tell you, I ever just have a stress. You gotta leave uncle. at some point, you know, and then lock it up. This happened to my uncle. He had a place, and the people refused to leave. And he's like, uh, and we all told him, move in, go move in with them, and yeah. make it unbearable yep. and he was gonna do that and they finally left but that's what i would do i'd be like hey honey i'm gonna go live with those assholes and it's gonna be loud music mm-hmm. and i'm gonna fart everywhere and i'm gonna make them just i mean the amount of money this person has already lost on 500 days of short-term rental long before 500 days i, I would have seen the writing on the wall yeah 30 like, days 60 and days. i would have been like okay the amount of money i could lose is worth this much to pay somebody like i would pay someone full time to harass Annoy that them. person yes full time yeah like yeah. what do you make like, this in this year air horns i'm gonna like, like i'm gonna cover all night yes long. i'm gonna cover yeah. your pay your job <laughs> and your job starts yeah. at like 10 p.m cut at the night. water off oh, yeah bro. Oh, power off. I got open window bees. Every, you know, yes, <laughs> every onslaught of everything. I, I would, li- I would, bees. I would literally pay somebody to just terrorize <laughs> the bees. That that person's got to leave to go to the grocery store. They leave to probably go Locus. do shit. Like <laughs> they would be terrorized until they they leave. I mean, that's hundred percent. So, you're gonna get gangster on me. I'm gonna get gangster right I back. Mean, that's so shit. crazy. Actually, gangster yeah. on you. No, it's like it's crazy. You can't kick someone out of your own. I mean, I get. I know why the laws exist. I like they exist why. Because, Explain to me why. I don't because understand they why. make the case that oh you. Can't kick out a family. They're hard on their luck. What are they going to do? Live on the street? That's four, five hundred days. That's five, it's over a year. You know, so you know the laws. Well, the laws are plan ahead. Yeah, you know that's kind of like how the world works. Like I get if they're like thirty days or something like that. You know. Yeah, but I mean the thing, the same thing. It's so funny because it's like you're you're thinking about that person and that family. It's like there's a lot of families where there's people that their living is off of rental incomes. They've been smart, conservative with their money, invested in houses. And so, I mean, imagine if all of our tenants at one time decided they were going to do that to us. Like, that would mm-hmm. hurt. It would even hurt us. It's and not so that, just that. That would, that would hurt financially to get hit with it's, that. It's, all. First, obviously, it's the right thing to do, right? But I, I think it's not just that. What happens with laws like this is it actually hurts the disenfranchised in ways that people don't realize. I'll give mm-hmm. you an example. Rent control laws, right? They're designed. People can't afford the, co- the rising cost of living. So we have to limit what you can charge in rent. And what that does is it, prevents any reinvestment into those areas to build more properties or to clean up their properties, make them livable and good and whatever. So you actually restrict what's available, thus making it harder. So you go to certain cities and areas with with price controls. Now a new family wants to move in. Nothing's available. There's nothing available. Sorry, we don't have anything. The market, it's artificially restricted and nobody wants to build because if you build... You can't cover the cost, yeah. Because of the, so what ends up happening is you restrict supply mm-hmm. rather than uh, encouraging supply. So it'd be like for, it, would, it would be like this. Here's the example: it would be like the government saying um, eggs. Eggs are a staple food. Okay, uh, everybody should have eggs. So we're going to make a law that says you cannot sell a dozen eggs for anything more than fifty cents. 
And that's it. That's the law. 50 cents. And then people who don't understand economics will be like, that's a good thing. We'll make eggs cheap. No, no, no. What will happen is people will stop selling eggs yeah. because farmers aren't going to sell eggs because they can't make money selling a dozen for 50 cents. Right. So now you stupid law means yeah. nobody gets eggs. You're right, right. Or somebody else who has the means buys up all the eggs and then the other people can't anyway. So. Uh, well, that, but it's, you know, the answer to that would be we'll just make more laws. You know, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so fun. Speaking yeah. of laws and rules, I just learned yeah. this this fact. Uh, you, you guys you guys love football, so I'll, I'll bring it up for oh, you. Well, I didn't know this was a thing in football. Hey, how about the Niners? <laughs> Football, football, American What's, football or soccer? The American football. Oh, we'll talk about the Beckham. I watched it. Oh, good, watched huh? Really good. Oh, really good, right? We'll get there. So, no, we can't talk about that. I didn't know this. Did you guys know in up until 1980 that football players were allowed to put stick them all over their hands and arms? Do you know what that is? Oh, you mean yeah. for their, you had to catch the glove? Yeah, dude. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They had to ban it because yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at a picture of it. What is that stuff? Well, it's you like see, tar. Yeah. I mean, what they do allow them to get away with are those well, wide receiver gloves. Yeah, and gloves. have you ever felt those things? Yeah. <laughs> They're, They're like crazy. almost like sticking. Yeah. You guys are like your fingertips. Just. Yeah. That's why, I mean, you, you see, the, not the, and by the way, not taking anything away from these amazing no, catches, yeah. but it's like there is a big difference between barehanded catching that and catching sure. that with those gloves. Those gloves are crazy. But, but stick them. I saw a picture. It's this. It's like green goo all over. They were playing like that. That's crazy. I mean, one of these uh, like sports, like, that's half of the game is like where's figuring out yeah where's the loop and then hole? having to regulate later that's like, oh, right okay, where's oops. what yeah i mean you know like in baseball they used to do that Dude, with like they the, the vaseline yeah. and they hide it in all these weird places and yeah there, there it is uh and tar uh, lester they call it the lester hayes rule because he would cover his hands Go to the go up, Doug, because it talks about what this oh, stuff. Dude, is. when I was playing rugby, it was so annoying because guys would like grease up their legs, and so and you're supposed to like tackle a specific way that was different than football. Yeah. So you'd like kind of let them run into you, and then you'd have to kind of turn. Them I mean, when, when and you did slip right out of your arms, and when I was millions like, of dollars this. are at on the table, of course, like you know, innovation, creativity, yeah. loopholes, like. That's like everything. Of course. You're, you're looking for every competitive edge that you can, of right? Course. So speaking of football, uh, yeah, yeah football. European style, uh, I'm watching the Beckham series on Netflix. So have you finished it or you're watching it? No, we're, all, we're on this. Uh, and you haven't, you haven't watched it second. yet? No. Oh, okay, bro, you, you need to watch it. it. It's really good. No, no, listen. I actually wish I was like hardcore into soccer and would have watched first of that. All, it would have been really fun I, first to watch First of all, watch I'm going I'm to I'm say this. I was never fans of the, of, of the Beckhams, right? Got to love them now, right? Because, they, you know why? Because they were the celebrities. They were like the Kardashians. Well, then right? the tabloids all the time. Tabloids. Yeah. I'm like, who cares? I don't care. Whatever. Well, the, here's why I like them so much. I don't care so much that he's an awesome soccer player, that she was a Spice Girl. I don't give a shit about that. The, but the odds that celebrity couples stay together as long as they have are low anyway. Right. When you hear about what how they, they loved each other. Yeah, it's cool. That's real. It's really cool. Bro, he used to, I think I said this on an earlier show. He used to f drive for four hours to see yeah. her for 12 minutes. Yeah. And then go back. And they went through, I don't know how far you were. They, yeah. they go through I got, some. I, yeah, the, where he was hated by the yeah, whole country. Yeah, yeah. And that, and then also, what, what? I mean, obviously there was infidelity and stuff like that. For them to have made oh, it I through. I didn't get to that part. Oh, though. yeah. So that, to make it through all the things that they went through and still stay together as a family, like that was really cool. Very inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and they're likable on it. You, like you very, very likable. Tease each other and stuff. Very, very likable. The part where she said she was like from a working class Yeah, yeah and he's like calling and he comes her through around the door. He's like, what did you, you drive? What did your dad drive? Yeah. And she kept trying to dance around it. She's all rolls Royce. He's yeah. like, all right. And he walks out. <laughs> Normal. Yeah, I know. It his was, parents. Yeah. I love his parents. Yeah. They are so supportive and hardcore. I mean, so he's just so, he's, uh, and to your, I was the same way. Um, I don't, I'm not, a, I don't follow soccer as, as much as a lot of other sports at all. So I, I'm like, I have a little bit of understanding of who's who and some of that. Of course, I know who David Beckham is. And so, but most of that is through news. Like tabloid know? shit. Yeah, tabloid yeah. stuff. Not because I really followed the sport. And so I had kind of a similar type of, like, whatever. You know, it's just some pretty pretty soccer player yeah, that married right. a fucking famous singer. He's very so, Kardashian. -like, but yeah. it's actually, it, I actually almost like feel sorry for him because of that. Because he was such a pretty guy. He marries the the the, the, the rock star, super, super girl that they got so much negative publicity when he's probably a really fucking cool guy and it's a and then the part with their kid dude that like just tore my yeah. like i can't imagine i mean especially you like you know how freaking paranoid you are about yeah, everything could you imagine the day you're from the day your kid was born to mm -hmm. getting death threats about your child and then you got to go perform on a soccer field 
in another city or a state or sometimes in another country and your wife is, oh, just got an, a, a letter that day like someone's trying to kill our son, huh, and you got to go perform no. and do your job, good luck. No way. Wow. Yeah, dude, that's crazy. I know. You can tell that his uh, he's so respected by his teammates, the way that they all talk about him. Like he's, uh, uh, they like him, like mm -hmm. genuinely, like like um, admire him. Like that, him. so there's a part, not to ruin, I'm going to ruin this. That's why I wanted to wait till all of us to talk about it. But there's a I part need to wash it now. where <laughs> he comes to play for Madrid. Did you get there? No. Oh, you didn't? No. Oh, fuck, bro. It's like, I just, Katrina and I both were like, wow. The the fact that these, a, a super team like Madrid takes on David Beckham, who's this young, like yeah. tabloid He's a man kid. You, Manchester U guy, right? And yes. And and the and the guys at Madrid that are all already superstars, the way they embraced him, like it, like it actually made me really respect soccer on another level because I don't know another professional sport where you got that many superstars, the new kid comes in like that, and for them to embrace him uh the way they did and try and to lift him up when there was wow. like, yeah, it's, you'll get to it and you'll be, and I just, I can't name another team that I've seen an example like that to that, to that level. Of course, there's uh, exa somewhat examples of that with some, some other sports, but not like that. I thought that was really, really, really impressive. And you could tell why that Madrid was such a dominant team for so many years because of their, 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 they knew that even with all these superstars that, we only win. We only go forward as a unit, and like that is like was like the foundation of like like we need to all go to dinners together. We need to do the like we have to bring our families. We have to do all that stuff like that for the the greater of the team. And you just in professional sports or people are making millions yeah. of dollars. You just don't. No. Yeah, everybody's separate. Yeah, and then to do that to the young guy, right? Who's already like got all this celebrity attention, yep. and then he comes into your circle. Interesting. And you're already a badass, and you're just, and then and he's coming in to potentially take another guy's position. It's mm, like mm. so. It was oh, a, cool. I yeah, it's a really dancer, in, yeah. interesting dynamic that happened no, 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 we're, we're, enjoy, we're enjoying we're, we're enjoying watching it because you know jessica her her mom's english and she lived in england uh when it was all popular and whatever so not beckham although she knew who he was or whatever but she thought she was a spice girl literally so she's she's all into victoria <laughs> beckham oh that's funny. she was a huge yeah spice girl fan yeah because she was a teenager right around that time yeah so i thought that hey was, speaking of huge thought. fans it seems like our strawberry Walnut uh, Ooh, coconut cream yeah. is like the hit. No, it's the, definitely my favorite. The creatures one. of habit. It, yes, You're, it's, it's 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 the one of their best sellers. Is there already? I don't know if it's a best seller yet. It's too early. I don't think it could hit. I don't think it's possible because it hasn't been out long enough to consider it a best seller. It's probably obviously a best seller this month, uh, for sure. Like, but what I'm seeing on the forum and the DMs that I'm getting is people saying it's their favorite flavor they've yeah. ever had. Awesome, which is so cool because that makes me happy that we we made that we collaborated on that. And I thought it was like a well, I took flavor. a few with me to Vegas, and um, I got to take uh, one of the the strawberry ones. Had my kids try; they definitely preferred that one over uh, the other flavors as well, the maple and all mm. that. Well, so. I told you guys, I shot down my ravioli flavor. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're gonna go with Adam's strawberry walnut. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm glad they kind of bypassed that completely. <laughs> that was bad. You know? Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm not a dude. flavor guy anyway. I'd be like, can we put more weird stuff in it? Yeah. Can you yeah. put some peptides in it. It's yeah. actually weird to me that some, the the handful of people I've met that actually don't like it. I'm like, how could you not like that oatmeal? You must not like oatmeal, period. Yeah. Or you're like, you know, have you ever met some of my best friends like this that are weird about textures, certain yeah. textures of food, like a, a soft with a hard, like yep. nobody can't do that. Yeah. He can't have a soft texture with a hard yeah, texture. Oh. And so if I'm you, only like that with stuff that like feels like snot, you know, like, uh, like what? Like, Tapioca. Yes, or uh, um, oysters. Or, oysters. Yeah, yeah. Wait, hold on. Yeah. You don't like tapioca? No. Tapioca I is either tapioca. a yes or no. Yeah, me too. I love tapioca. I love tapioca. Yeah, yeah. I love the little, whatever those balls are in there. What is yeah. it? Tapioca. That's what tapioca is? <laughs> That's the actual tapioca. Yeah. What I mean, is tapioca? Made, it's, a, it's a root, I believe. Really? It's a starch. Yeah, oh. and it's a powder. You can actually make your own little tapioca balls. So, How, so, what's it, what's the uh, macro profile on? Is it like I you, mean, do you, probably, how bad is it for you? Or you? Probably not good it. for you. I know. I, it tastes too good to be. I drink good it with for the straw. That's what they make boba <laughs> out of. But is it? Uh, would you? So, oh, boba is made from that. So those yeah, are, those so little balls. The, yeah. I bet. I bet. So you that those like those uh no those, those drink boba that drinks shit. that's that's actually tapioca balls. Yes. Oh, interesting. And those ones are black, and tapioca is typically white. I think they do something to make it dark. I'm not sure exactly what they oh. add. Some of them have brown sugar included. 
I love oh, it. I'm, an, I'm kind of an expert on Boba because my daughter, <laughs> Bree, she loves oh, it, you know? it. You know, that one grew on me, right? The first time I had it, I, I was like in my early 20s. One of my clients brought it to me, uh, a Vietnamese lady. And I was like, this is weird. Yeah. But after having it a couple times, I actually started to really like it. So that's like one of those acquired. I love Boba. Do you? Yeah. Did you like it right out the gates? Yeah, I liked it. I like chewing on it. I mean, you like... won't like it. Have you had it? No, it's, sli- it's really slimy. Oh, yeah, like the, no, the, no. the you, you suck chewy. It's yeah. slimy and chewy. It's you like, know, it's like uh, kombucha had that like slimy film over the that's, top. That's just different. Blech. That's different. Yeah, that's kind yeah. of. Justin no, won't thanks. eat anything slimy or anything that's phallic shaped. Remember when he tried to get me to pop? But yeah, I feel like those are these are the people that don't like though. the. Keep if trying. you don't like creatures of habit, it's like that. You have like a texture thing because yeah. the oatmeal has that. Which I love the the seeds and the things in there. So do I. Because it gives it texture. Besides just slopping down oatmeal, I think it gives it a different. I thought I thought he crushed it with that idea, which that I didn't do that. I used to I didn't put the seeds in there like that. Mm-hmm. I always was just like the the walnuts and a, a like yeah. fruit or something like that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, some people don't do. like who's, that. Who's our shout out today, by the way? Um, it's uh, it's David Meltzer. I think I'm gonna say it right. I've been following him for a while, and I don't know how I came across his stuff. I like a lot of the content he puts out. And it was where, so when I shared the the kind of fitness tip that you did today, that's where it was inspired from that. I thought that he he kind of articulated that point really well. So uh, shout out to David. I think uh, he's got some pretty good content on there. When it comes to muscle building, fat loss, your hormones and recovery, sleep is everything. Well, there's a company that makes a pre-bed drink that combines the power of magnesium, with other natural ingredients that have been shown in studies to promote more restful sleep and to help you fall asleep faster. It's all natural. There's no crazy sedatives. You can use it nightly. It's good stuff. It's called sleepbreakthrough.com. Go to sleepbreakthrough.com forward slash mind pump. Use the code mind pump 10 for a discount. All right, back to the show. First question is from Amy Lang 25. How do I train to failure for the most muscle building when I train alone. All right, let's uh, answer this advanced first. Advanced maps and a bulk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> next oh, question. Next beautiful. question. He got it. No, you know what? Okay, there's Punctual. two There's two general schools of thought around failure training. Okay, one of them is right. One of them is wrong. <laughs> so here's what they are, right? One school of thought is failure means you can't move the weight anymore. It literally means you fail. So you're doing squats and you're on the ninth rep and you really mm. grind it up and you're struggling. And then the 10th rep, you come up a halfway and then you fail and you drop the weight. That's one school of thought. The second school of thought is that failure is the last good form rep that you can do. Yep. Anything beyond that, and now your form is off and you're now training bad recruitment patterns, your injury risk goes through the roof. You don't want to strengthen bad recruitment patterns. You don't want to increase that risk of injury. And there is no additional value in going past that intensity. I belong, we belong to that second That's the smarter school, version. Right. So when you're training alone and you're going to failure, what you need to do is you need to do go to the last good rep. And that's usually a rep that you're grinding out, you're feeling, and you know you probably can't perform another one. So that'll keep you safe in the sense that you're not going to drop the bar or totally fail. However, the risk of overestimating the rep is still there, especially when you first start training to failure because you can't gauge Mm -hmm. where failure is. So I always recommend if you train to failure, whether you have a workout partner or not, to use safeties when you use a barbell. I don't even like to do it with a partner because if I fail on an exercise with a barbell with a partner, that means that they have to know how to spot me properly. And they usually screw that up. They usually make, I've gotten hurt with a partner spotting me wrong mm-hmm. way more than I have failing uh, with a barbell. Yeah. And on that sort of note, uh, I definitely wouldn't do like a one rep max. Uh, no. th- I wouldn't recommend that unless, you know, you're, you're testing out for some sport. Uh, but in general, multiple reps uh, to failure. And then to your point of like losing um, form is really, that's, that's the metric I, I would stick with uh, for the, for the majority of like, that's considered failure to me is when I can't per- uh, perform it with perfect form. Yeah, I, I just want to make it clear to the audience that you can build the most amazing physique and get really, really strong and never train to failure. That's right. Yeah, you can totally so, do that. I know obviously we program that in advanced maps and a bulk to teach people how to do it if you were going to program it. But the truth is that 
um, of all the things that are going to factor in you getting strong, you losing body fat, you building muscle, training to failure uh, does not crack even cl close to the top 10. No. It's not necessary at all to do that. It's and just so, a tool. Right. And so, uh, you know, if you don't feel like it, you don't feel comfortable with it, I would just say don't do it right now. Uh, if you really wanted to, I think I would ask questions like, well, what exercise are we talking about? And then I could give you uh, a specific suggestion to that exercise, like how I do it. There's certain ones that I don't even mess with, though, to be honest. Like, I don't know. I've never, I don't know if I've ever trained. I mean, I guess to mechanical failure. Right. But I, I don't risk like an overhead press uh, with like a, a substantial amount of weight that I wouldn't do. Maybe I would do it in a seated press where I'm supported and really? I have, yeah, hmm. where I have like a military. Like, I don't have a problem going to failure with overhead press because I feel pretty confident bringing the weight down to my chest or, or, or dropping the weight. Yeah, you can get rid of it pretty easy. I think benching, benching is probably the most. Um, Bench squat dead. That's deadlifts, it. you could, you could, because oh, you could easily. drop the bar. Yeah, easily. That's yeah. what I said. Bench squat dead are the three. That you would catch me training, training with different. safeties with bench and squat though. All of them, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But deadlift you don't need it. No, and then with. But I'm talking then, about without safeties, bench not a good idea to go to. No, 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 definitely not. Yeah. But, but I mean that's how that's most how vulnerable probably that's the. But I mean that's why lifting. that's why too all the rest of exercises out there the the value that I get from yeah. it isn't worth the setup or the risk. Right. And deadlift doesn't require any sort of setup. You literally just drop the bar in that situation. Squatting, if you know how to practice bailing on the bar or safeties yeah. easy there Just let it go behind yeah you. and bench go press forward. put the safety bars on the most benches have the safety bars put that there so it at least gets you can get yeah, your you neck know, out i you don't know? think this is an issue anymore right um uh most good home gyms have safeties prx does yeah. uh the old school benches didn't i remember the old school ones with no safeties where it was just you unrack it and the bench actually came with the rack type of deal where I've gotten stuck under that before. And there is a technique to it, by the yeah. way, if you get stuck under the bar where you can get out. It doesn't feel good, but you can do it. Squatting, you practice failing with safeties. If you don't have safeties, you got to know how to dump the bar. Do not let a spotter save you from a failed squat. Mm -mm. That is such an easy way to I actually, I've seen some people get hurt because I, of that. I don't recommend a spotter for squatting at all. Yeah. I just don't. I think it's, it's such a better exercise to bail when you feel mechanical, Agreed. when yeah. you feel mechanical, you'll catch me. I mean, I used to do it a lot to where like people would trip out. They'd be like, Oh my God, are you trying to hit a PR every day? And I'm like, no, as soon as I feel mechanical breakdown and I'm loaded, right. I'm 300 plus pounds on my back. I just drop mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. yep. Why risk it? I yeah. just, if I'm coming up and I'm like, Oh, I, I overestimated my strength today. That's right. and I'll just let it go. That's right. Instead of trying to grind through it or saying, Hey, come spot me and have some dude hug me from behind. And like, why? Yeah. It makes yeah. no sense. Like if you're going to push the weight that much, then learn how to, to bail on it or put safeties to where you which, can Which, by the way, go. the only proper way, if you were to get spotted on squat, which you shouldn't, you need to know how to drop it or um, use safeties, is literally a person has to hug your hug chest you and, like, yeah, and you come up. up with you. And nobody does that. Everybody tries no. to grab the ball. And then when they do that, they push you forward just slightly. And yeah. so you lose your balance forward, which is the worst case scenario, which I've seen that happen so many times. Yeah, uh, no, 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 no. Just not a back or knees to, or something. To have yeah, but, but again, I'm going to make this point again. Whatever you train, you strengthen. So if you're going beyond good form to squeeze out another rep, that means your form has changed and that intense last rep is g going towards whatever that form was that you used. So if I'm benching, like a common thing to happen when someone benches and they actually fail, or not the rep that's perfect, but the one after that, they go for another one, is you see this twisting yeah. or shoulder rolling. Arching. And then maybe they get it up. But here's what you just strengthened, that form. That's, that's what it. you just strengthened. That's it. So it takes away from good technique. It encourages bad technique because that's what you're strengthening. And that last rep is the most productive rep. So I do not like the whole, like if you, you go until you can't lift the bar. I know very few people who have the technique and skill to do that without their form going out the window. It's very rare. Only really advanced lifters I've seen be able to do that properly. Next question is from Amanda 10. Every time my family sees a video of me squatting, they say, watch your knees because the women in my family have a history of arthritis and bursitis. Are there any special considerations I should take into account while lifting with that history? Nope. No. <laughs> yeah, your special considerations are the same considerations that we would tell anybody to have, which mm -hmm. is, to ensure good technique, good control, good stability. And if you don't have those things, work towards those things and to always train appropriately. That's it. 
So it used to be believed that joints got bad because they were used too much. Mm. Okay. Technically, that could happen. Uh, very unlikely. You'd have to really beat yourself up with just work. You. This is what usually happens 99% of the time. Joints are used in suboptimal ways over and over again, and that causes problems. So it's no different than a, a machine, right? Look at a machine with pulleys. If there, you got a pulley with a chain on it and the chain is off just slightly and then pulley's still working, over time it's going to twist the pulley or cause problems. Or if you're looking at like a sliding glass door that slides on a groove and it's slightly off the groove, it's going to start to chew up the groove a little bit. The joints are not, here's what's different about your joints than a machine. Your joints are alive. That's living tissue that adapts and strengthens. So if you squat appropriately and properly with good technique, good stability, good control, mm -hmm. not only will you not cause knee pain, knee pain, you will prevent knee pain. You will cause your knees to be healthier longer. This is why old people who strength train properly have far better mobility than people who don't move. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. So it's the opposite. Now, the, the, this this whole like family yeah, history. You train the muscles is strength to, yeah. to get you to through the movement. I mean, the only thing really, if you're going to go from like the frequency aspect of it is is if you're can always continuously in the sagittal plane and reinforcing that, uh, you know, one plane of motion to where, you know, this is why we always kind of bring up like unilateral training or we, we bring up other ways to kind of, uh, have your joints acclimate towards these other stresses, twisting mm -hmm. or sideways kind of forces uh, to consider. So you have to be able to sprinkle that in or, or step out of like your, your uh, programming to make sure you're accounting for those types of movements. So your joint can be reinforced and strengthened. But other than that, I mean, squatting and, and strengthening is everything. So we should also break down though the, uh, what arthritis and bursitis is and the difference, right? Like I had bursitis in my hips. And I had bursitis in my hips because I had weak hips and poor mobility. Yep. So I, I had it stems from the weakness. Yeah. So I was I had weak hips. I had uh, poor hip mobility, um, and I was still strength training. And what would happen? And or I would sit in a car for a long period of time, and I would get just the worst pain in my hip. It felt like someone was sticking a knife in the side of my hip. And what it ends up happening is your body thinks that there's an injury or something is wrong with that area because I'm, I'm I'm weak and lack the mobility, yet I was still squatting and strength training. And so then it sends fluid there into these sacs, and that is, those sacs are what ends up pushing out and then causing all this like pain. They become and, inflamed. And, yeah, and mm -hmm. it becomes inflamed. Now, arthritis is autoimmune. So you, that's something that genetically someone could have passed down, or it could be something that your body's well. There's different kinds of arthritis. Yeah, yeah rheumatoid arthritis, of, which is yeah, that. rheumatoid would be autoimmune. Yeah. Then there's you know like osteo or you know arthritis from poor movement that can cause the joints to start to degenerate. So uh, nonetheless, regardless of the kind of arthritis that you have, uh, having joints that are strong and mobile and supported well and that are that move the way that they're supposed to will make whatever your propensity to have much better. In other words, or even if gone. you have- I, My bursitis is gone. Well, bursitis is totally different. Bursitis, yeah. like the, those fluid- those That's why I wanted to tell the difference because they're not yeah. the same thing. You no, have to understand that they're not- Inflammation driven. Yeah. Yes. Well, br the bursa sacs themselves get inflamed. The bursa sacs are, are, are filled with, I think, synovial fluid. And the job is to cushion the joint, allow the joint to move well. But if it's not moving well, it's pressing on those bursa sacs. The sacs become inflamed in an attempt- to limit movement. So here's the thing that people need to realize with the body. It's smart. It's a safety mechanism. And so your body, when you're not moving well, uh, your body will try to limit movement with tight muscles, with inflamed bursa, bursitis, with all kinds of things to kind of make you stop moving it so that it can heal. But if you're moving poorly and you go back to moving poorly, you're just going to cause that problem to happen again. So for you with your bursitis in your hips, it, it flared up when you squatted. Yeah. So you yeah. stopped squatting. Yep. And it but, went away. But this was where it gets kind of frustrating because there's a lot of fear. You know, you go to your doctor about all this stuff. It's like, well, we need to address this like crazy inflammation. And then you look at like cortisol shots and yeah. things yeah. to like deal with that, which is literally temporary. We're not like building strength and better like recruitment patterns to to absolve that problem. And then later on, what's the next thing that they're going to offer is surgery? And yeah. it's like th those are the two hammers that they have. So um, you have to look at it from from a uh, you know, from a therapy, physical therapy slash like exercise, uh, uh, 
lens. This is, I'm so glad you brought that up, Justin. And this is why I wanted to talk a little bit more about this. If I went to the doctor and complained about my bursitis, that is what they give of me. Of course. Give me a shot to bring down yeah, the inflammation right and right then right tell there. me I should lay off the heavy squatting. That would have been the prescription. And you would have felt better. Yep. Yes. And you would have felt better, but, yep. your, but your recruitment pattern, your the way you moved won't change. So what eliminated it though was doing 90-90s and squatting deeper. Mm -hmm. So getting to a place where I had hip mobility and I had hip strength and stability and then more gluten and then strengthening up even more by taking a full range deep squat and now i've i haven't had that in almost 10 years now it would be it's like, crazy it, how how bad it was too i mean it was so bad for the audience to understand how it was like i kind of had this i had it so bad that if i drove in a car for longer than 15 to 20 minutes, I would have to pull over and get out and like stretch my legs yeah. because it literally felt like someone was sticking a knife in the side of my Think hip. about it. This like I've used this example before. I think it's a good analogy. It's like, uh, imagine a window, you know, you open your window and the window slides along a groove. So the bottom of the window maybe has like a little fin that slides in a groove and you slide the window open and you slide it back. And then you notice, oh my God, it's getting all chewed up towards the front of the track that it runs on. But rather than line up the window better, which is probably what you need to do, you just spray some more lubricant on it. Mm -hmm. And you just do that over and over again to make, well, it's not going to work for very long. At some point, it's going to continue to break down. Yeah, friction is still happening. Yeah, the, the, the solution would be, why is, it dry, why is it dragging so hard against the front side of this track? And you look at it, you're like, it's not lined up properly. Let me line up the window a little better. And then boom, no problem. You don't need to worry about it anymore. That's how the joints work. They work in a way that's optimal. And then there's suboptimal ways that allow them to work. But if you add load to the suboptimal ways and you use them over and over again, then you start to get the kind of wear and tear that your body can't heal from because it's it's wear and tear that it's not normal wear and tear and it causes problems. Now, the other part of the question was, I have a family history. You may have a family history of, of movement patterns and joints that move in a particular way. And so there may be issues that pop up in your family because of it, but that doesn't mean mm -hmm. you can't You're work on the root issue, yeah. right? You may have a family history of low back pain because everybody's maybe, you know, you know, genetically has a little bit of an anterior pelvic tail, or maybe your knees, you have, you have your knees that come mm -hmm. in at an angle, like mine do that a little bit, right? So once you notice that, you work on areas to support and strengthen you work on mobility, you work on the right exercise and how to perform those exercises, find the real issue, then your knees are going to be healthier than if you if you didn't do those things at all. Far healthier. So that's the answer. Next question is from Luca Curran. You talk about the detriment of eating immediately post-workout as your body is still in sympathetic drive. However, I've heard from other sources that it is precisely why you should eat post-workout as it gets your body into parasympathetic drive very quickly. So I'm confused. Should I eat or not eat immedi immediately after my workout? This is why I love having a podcast because <laughs> we have long form. Yeah. It's a long form form of media and we can explain the differences There's and the nuances. Nuance. Yeah, because it depends on the person, mm -hmm. okay? Um, not, er, er, not Nothing is right for everybody when it comes to health and fitness. And this is one of those things that's true. This is actually a quite easy one. Who would not benefit or who would get a detriment from eating right after they work Somebody out? Somebody who has gut issues. Yeah, gut issues. Yeah. Yeah, if you already have gut issues and you notice you're reactive, you get bloat, digestive issues, avoid eating right after a workout because right after a workout, you have some kind of normal systemic inflammation. That's what happens after a workout, which could promote uh, leaky gut, right? It could promote the gut from the, the junctions that, that are supposed to stay tight in the gut, spread out because of inflammation. And you could encourage by eating right in that during that period of time f uh, for proteins and uh, other parts of the food to pass through the gut when they're not supposed to, and you could develop food intolerances, or it could lead to further inflammation, which can cause dysbiosis. Right, your your gut bacteria gets thrown off or whatever. So if you're you have gut issues or you're prone to gut issues, then I would not eat right after a workout. Who would benefit from eating right after a workout? Somebody who struggles to hit enough of their protein intake every day or can't get enough and, calories. And they have good, their gut health is fine. Yep. And or somebody who plans on working out again mm -hmm. in, a, in a few hours. It, because studies will show that that person who ate right after the workout is going to be better prepared for performance, you know, for a workout that happens later in the day. So who's that? Like, you know. High school football kids who right. are about going to go do double days. You should probably eat a meal right after your, your first session because you're yeah. going to go back later this afternoon. I mean, recovery is everything for that 
situation, yes. right? And then it, again, and this is where we actually did like little ice baths in between, yeah. which then there's controversy over that in terms Stupid. of building muscle and blah, blah, blah. But yeah, you have to look at it as what's going to benefit you best based on, you know, what my pursuit is going for. And for a healthy person who's general population, it doesn't fucking matter. No. No, it's, it's not that so big. So glad of you guess. said that. Yeah, it's is, like if you didn't fit one of those specific categories stuff. that we just said, like oh, if you have gut issues, avoid it right afterwards. Oh, if you have, if you're an athlete who's going to work out a second time, if you're not one of those two people, it doesn't fucking yeah, matter. Do what you do. What it's you like. so it's so splitting hair difference on the benefits or the the detriments of doing that that it doesn't matter. So if you like to eat right after your workout because your favorite, you know, like at my favorite chicken and rice bowl place is right next to my gym so I could get a workout mm -hmm. and I used to go right next door order yep. and eat it and that's out of convenience, it works well for you to make a good choice, fucking do it. Yeah. And if it's for if it's inconvenient for you because it's like, man, I don't want to lug all this food in my bat duffel bag. There's not a restaurant that I can go eat at that's healthy. It's just easier if I get home 3 hours later and eat, then do that. Yeah, here's here <laughs> by the way, here's why this is a question at all. Here's why the person writing this thought, I need to ask this question. It's really important because the fitness industry is driven by uh, sales, like in all <laughs> industries, yeah. supplements being one of the top sellers, yeah. they communicate, uh, you know, taking prepackaged protein powders and yes. supplements post-workout all the time. And so it distorts the, the, the understanding. It makes you think it's more important than it isn't, uh, than it is. It's not important. This literally is not important at all, except for specific categories. If you like to eat after, then do it. If you don't, you don't. It literally makes no difference uh, for that. Like ninety nine percent of the people watching this right now, it makes no difference. But you think it makes a difference because we're constantly <laughs> they're trying to sell us supplements all the time, <laughs> especially post workout supplements. Next question is from Local Noon Enterprises. If you owned a gym today, what requir requirements would a brand new trainer need to meet? Before they could train someone in your gym, a hundred mind pump episodes. That's not a bad one. Yeah, a huh. hundred. Yeah, a like hundred. You get earlier, later ones. Yeah, yeah. More, more no, recent. No, 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 no. Yeah, not the early ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta just this put that is out great. there. <laughs> they learn shit. No, yeah. <laughs> we taught some things in there too. We yeah. did teach. Uh, I mean, I'm. That's kind of tongue in cheek, but there's some truth to that. Yeah. Uh, I think that. That amount of hours dedicated to probably learning like that, even though it's not at a formal certification, I feel like they probably have a, a, a better uh, sense. I mean, I feel like Doug could probably be a, a, an elite trainer. He doesn't have any. National, oh, yeah. He doesn't have a national certification. He doesn't have a degree in kinesiology, but I think he'd be better trainer than 80% of the trainers totally. that are training in a gym because of yeah. just being around and consuming I, the content. I would want to see on paper, okay, I would want to see some kind of education. So a certification that I, uh, you know, that I respected or some college education, just because it shows you've had interest and you went to study it. I would want that. I would experience not necessary. Sometimes, usually it's a good thing to have experience, but not necessary. I hired plenty of brand new trainers. On paper, there's not much. There's a lot of stuff I could see that would make me disqualify you. Like, oh, you've had 15 jobs in the last year. Mm. <laughs> That's weird. But there's a lot, a lot of, not much I would see on the paper, on the resume that would make me go, you're hired, you know, on the spot. Really, I'd have to meet them and I, what I'm looking at are how good you are at communicating. Mm -hmm. okay. Character. Do yeah. you, and, and do you, yeah, their character. How passionate they are. Are you, are you likable? Yep. Are you a likable person? Are you trainable? Do you communicate well? Because those I can work with. Everything else, I really don't care. And I hear a yeah, lot I've, of people with, with almost none, nothing else that did so well with this. Yeah, story. I don't care at all. I, I mean, if you did a good job, um, interviewing them. I think that matters everything. Like uh, in, in an interview, you should be asking like behavioral based type questions yep. in a situation where a client has a knee injury and you're not sure what you're supposed to do. How would you handle that situation? Yeah. And then listen to them. And then you're going to, you're that's going to tell you a lot about this, that person. That's going to be a hard question. Like, man, what would I do? Yeah. You know? And they, they're like, well, you know, I would, I would let the client know that I'm not sure about this. Let me talk to my boss and learn what I'm supposed to do. I want to make sure like, that's a really good answer. You're like, oh, wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. This person, when they don't know, they're willing to admit they don't know. They're going to come to an authority to learn and they're going to teach. Oh, I, I could trust this person right. with one of my clients. So yeah, that is so important that when you interview that you've asked a lot of these situational behavioral based type of questions to get a real good judge of their character. Cause I'll take somebody as green as they come mm -hmm. that doesn't know anything about training, but has the right characteristics to, for me to develop and teach them to be a great trainer. Because 
it, they, they only got to have about a certification or a little bit of a experience to be more educated than the average person who's working out for them to help that person. And then as long as they're willing to learn themselves and handle mm-hmm. scenarios like that where they don't know the right way, then I'm, I'm confident yeah. to let them to do that. I don't think you need a lot of education coming into it. I think you, I think I would look for somebody that would want to pursue it at yeah. least, you know, and like have that desire to, um, have that tool, uh, you know, in, in their, in their toolkit. Um, but really like it's, it's the passion behind it. And also too, I would say like those five commandments we listed yeah. on, on the other, uh, episode, I think they would have to abide by that completely and like share those values. Uh, really it's a value thing for me and it's an integrity thing and it's, um, the willingness to, uh, to really like want to help and change somebody's life. And, and, and they're all in on that idea. Yeah, I'll tell you guys, this is the truth now. I, I used to, when I would manage gyms and even, and then when I owned my own studio, I used to oftentimes work out in other gyms. This is just a smart thing to do. You want to work out in your competitor's gym, see what's going on, whatever. And, um, of all the places I recruited from, I, I recruited one person ever from another gym. You know where I recruited other people from? Restaurants. Recruited a guy who sold cars. I recruited a guy from uh, uh, a Foot Locker. I, record, I recruited a young lady at a retail store because of how she was talking and how she was you know, working with people. This is where I used to pull people from. I, at one time, one time did I recruit uh, from a gym. And that's, I mean, that's, that's pretty much it, but likable, good communicator, willing to learn, obviously have some passion. Um, and you, you got yeah. the job. These are all character traits. That's it. I mean, yeah. that's, that By the way, be- you want to hear a good, a good interview. I, I learned this from, um, years ago from someone who did interviewing for a living, a great, a great way to ask questions on an interview. Cause obviously if you ask them a question, they're going to give you the answer they think you want to hear. Yeah. Ask them why you answer, ask that question. Well, not just that. Mm. They said, this is what I learned. This is what I learned. And I used it and it worked really well. What you say is you name, you talk about something that you value and then you ask them for an example of a time that they displayed that and you, and you wait and watch them come up with a story. Right. And it's hard to come up with a bullshit story on the, on the fly. So I'll say something like, you know, we really value passion here at, you know, maps gym or whatever. We'd like to be passionate about our clients, passionate about fitness, helping people out. When was a time in your life when you really demonstrated passion and then you quiet and watch and see how quickly they can come up with a story or whatever. It was one of the best interview techniques. So the, yeah, that's a behavioral base. So if the, yeah. this person, uh, I actually did this with Katrina not that long ago, by the way, there's an example of chat, G, chat GVT <laughs> is a great tool for something like this. Give me t- like, I'm a gym owner. Give me 10 behavioral based questions for a trainer. Isn't that crazy? And chat GBT will spit off. I 10, saw, I've seen that 10 good questions for you to ask somebody that are behavioral based, just like you're saying right uh-huh. now. And so I love to do exactly what you said. So I love this, by the way, like, uh, obviously hiring and firing trainers was most of my career and I was terrible at it at the beginning on. And I, as I got better and better, I realized like, man, the secret to a great staff is just hiring well, is, is learning how to not have, because it's got a high turnover rate. And if I got better at figuring that out at the beginning, who who had the right characteristics job, 10 million to be a sal easier. or adjusted, yeah, yeah, it made my job a million times better. And so it took years of getting good at this. And one of those big hacks was understanding what behavioral based questions are, where to ask that, and then like what you said, and then actually asking them after they answer me, like, like why did you choose that story? Yes. <laughs> why did you choose that story to tell me? Like to really get to get to know somebody oh. and and make them yeah open up. Oh yeah. fuck, because they're like, damn, I was ready for that story. It's like a but, canned answer. Yeah, and but like, oh wait. Yeah. Yeah, but now you explain to me like why did you choose that, right? So um, those are just some things that you can do to find out. Man, you do a good job at an interview and really get to know somebody like that. I mean, they'll figure it out. You know, I I guarantee that if I, you know, had the opportunity to get a hold of these guys when they were first just getting started at stuff, they would be amazing. And it doesn't matter if they had 10 certifications or none. They have the characteristics to become great. And that's what you want to be able to figure out before. And you don't want to discount could imagine discounting one of you guys because you didn't have that experience would be the worst decision you could ever make Mm -hmm. look if you like mind pump head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free fitness and health guides we have a lot and they're totally free you can also find all of us on instagram justin is at mind pump justin i'm at mind pump de stefano and adam is at mind pump adam 